brought to you by CNBC Africa and Safaricom Business. Great partners inspire great visions. And welcome. We're coming to you from the Crown Plaza Hotel in Nairobi. I'm Nozi Pombanjo. Welcome to the special CNBC Africa World Economic Forum debate. This is one of three debates which we are building up to the road in Abuja, where the World Economic Forum on Africa will be taking place later this year in May. The second and the third of these debates will take place in Lagos and Johannesburg, respectively. Focusing on the East African region today, we're going to be discussing this debate under the theme connecting East Africa and of course the panelists that are going to be taking on this discussion uh, from my far right we have Jay Island he is the CEO for General Electric Africa and next to him is uh, Richard Bell he is the vice chairman of the Wananchi group and we also have a leading industrialist in East and Central Africa Dr. Tandaria and the founding chairman of the East African Business Council and closest to me is Edwin Macharia he is a partner at Dow Alberg. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time uh, to join me this morning. Now, we have heard that East African integration has been perhaps at the foremost on the continent when it comes to the integration process. But today I think we're going to have honest discussions rather about how much integration has really taken place. Where are the bottlenecks that have perhaps slowed down some of the progress? But most importantly, where are the opportunities that can fast pace and accelerate us towards this ideal of an integrated region? And perhaps let me first start off with you, Dr. Chandaria, for you to paint the landscape for us. How much integration has really taken place in East Africa? Well, in some of the cases, uh, integration has taken place where it does not make an uh, impact. <laughs> Name-wise, yes. Where it should make an impact and where it will improve the lifestyle of people, it's not making. Uh, and the reasons being that there is no political will. And political will changes every four or five years when the new government comes in. It's not the people. So I think impact is there, but with high hopes, with big plans, things don't work. High hopes, big plans, political will, uh, certainly issues that we're going to be getting back to. Perhaps, Edwin, your assessment of uh, <coughs> the amount of regional integration that has really taken place. Mm. I'd agree with Dr. Chandari. If you think of regional integration being free movement of people, services, and goods, uh, I think on some of those elements we rhetorically are doing well, but practically we still have a long, a long way to go. East Africa is talked about as being fairly well integrated, but the reality is the ECOWAS region, for example, is far much better integrated in terms of people, right? So they have an ECOWAS passport, far much easier movement of people back and forth. Uh, literally this week, I was traveling to Tanzania with a colleague who's not Kenyan, who happens to have an Indian passport. Mm. Uh, and even though they have a work permit from Kenya, they were required to have to get a new visa to get into Tanzania. Right. And so those are the kinds of very practical challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. To Dr. Chandaria's point, integration has happened at a rhetorical and a political level. But when it comes to at, you know, at the enterprise and the individual level, I think there's still a ways to go. Jay, your thoughts on the practicality of what's unfolding on the ground, and in particular, whether from a business and investor point of view, you're seeing the integration that should enable a, a big player like GE to be very mm -hmm. robust in the region. Well, I think when I think you when you think about regionalization, you look at East Africa, and there's a huge opportunity. You've got probably 170 million people between the countries uh, that that represent a huge economic force. And the issue you have coming in as a multinational is you can't do everything in every single country. So you need the ability to be able to put operations in certain countries to serve others. Uh, you may do programs in other countries. You need movement of workers and talent. You know, we do not, we have Kenyans that are working in South Africa, in Nigeria, uh, everywhere. And, and we need that, that movement of talent within the East Africa as well. So, I mean, those are the kind of things that unlock the opportunity of those 170 million people that are there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you're able to, to really serve them and, and obviously 
you know, continue to fix all of the issues of around infrastructure and things. But I think overall it's a huge opportunity, and I agree with, uh, with, with Edwin and, and, and Dr. Chandaria around, you know, making sure that this happens. We really need some push. Richard, your honest assessment of especially <laughs> focusing uh, from an enterprise level, if you may. Well, let me give you a very practical example of the problem. Um, when I visit my businesses in Uganda and Tanzania, I fly myself in my own plane. Um, now, we are supposed to have uh, free movement of labor, free movement of transport, um, uh, and free movement of, of goods. So if I want to fly to Tanzania, I have to call the Tanzanian Aviation Authority two weeks before I travel to get a permit to fly my Kenyan plane into Tanzania, and we're supposed to be regionally integrated. Um, now, that's, that's a pain for me in the table, general aviation industry. Now take it to the next level. All three countries have thriving tourism businesses. Tourism depends on aviation. Um, aviation is completely closed in East Africa. You, can't, you, you can almost not fly across the borders. So, so instead of having a thriving regional business where um, tourists could go from Nairobi to Samburu in northern Kenya, fly across to Gidepo in, in Uganda, um, fly down to uh, southern Uganda to look at the gorillas, and then fly from southern Uganda across into Tanzania to Serengeti and back to Nairobi, which, which would be an enormous benefit for the tourism industry, you can't do that. Um, those tourists have to fly from Nairobi to northern Kenya, back to Nairobi, to Entebbe on an international mm. flight, from Entebbe up to Gidepo, back to Entebbe, um, back, back onto an international flight, across to Kigali, onto another flight, back from Kigali to Dar es Salaam, from Dar es Salaam back to Arusha. Back, and and so, so where's the regional integration, right? It, it's, it's, it's operating like three completely different countries. And, and that's fundamentally the problem. We, we, have, we have policies and, and treaties at a high level, but at the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts level, whether it's tourists or or, or my fiber optic cables across border, or, or Dr. Chandaria's um, uh, metal sheets trying to go from one factory to another factory, that on the ground, it just isn't happening. Who do we put the blame to? Why are not we not moving forward from this rhetoric and into practical implementation? Uh, to me, I think that uh, it's a political will. Unless you've got a very strong political will, we want to be together. Uh, it's, a, it's a forced marriage. And in a forced marriage, you want to be a party, but you don't want to really get married. <laughs> so I think it's a political which is necessary, and the, and the East African community agenda should be driven by the top people of the country, means the presidents. It cannot be driven at a number two or number three level, because that will set, set the ideology of Rwanda's interest, mm. Uganda's interest. Unless it's being done in that way, uh, you, it's, you know, there's a lot of consultation, lots of paper, lots of ideas, lots of thoughts. Uh, I think it's not necessary. There are few things which have to do which will bring results. Mm. And without bringing the results, we can continue. A time will come, nobody's going to pay a portion to the EAB to continue. Let's talk about the role and the inclusion of the private sector. Jay, let me come back to you on this one. Do you get a sense that business is part of the conversation that seeks to move beyond the rhetoric? Um, I think it's slowly getting there. I think enough people are highlighting some of the issues that are happening based on what the thought, what, what the, you know, the structure says that can happen and what, as you heard, you know, on the ground. So I think that's starting to happen. And I think when you look, we're in, we're basically an infrastructure company. And so you look at what we do, which is, you know, power, uh, power generation, healthcare, <clears throat> uh, locomotives, tr transportation, those kind of things are critical for a regional integration. Because you can, you can, you know, sell power to each other. You can. You need a railroad to go to help the landlocked countries. You need transport. So there's a lot of value in integration where you have free movement of goods and people. And I think it's starting to come. But I think again, the devil's in the details and how it works every day. And that's really the hard part. And it's and it's a similar aspect, not just here in East Africa, but also West Africa and and Southern Africa. And and 
to unlock the potential of, of a, a lot of countries, not just four or five, the regional integration is really what's going to have to but make But the it institutions work. are there. So are we saying that uh, the institutions are weak? Are we saying that they do not have the capacity to drive for a, a, for a regulatory framework that would work within the region? Well, I think you have institutions that are at the regional level, but then it's each country implementing mm -hmm. what the regional institutions, uh, you know, develop. And I think that's where there's some dis disconnects. Yeah. But, you know, the institutions are there. But the, the, the political direction has to be given to those institutions. So, um, you know, when we see discussions of East African integration um, in the press and politicians talking about East African integration, it's all about political integration and currency integration. Mm. Well, guess what? Um, in Kenya, we're doing political disintegration. We have 46 counties now. Um, the idea that at a regional level we're going to go in the opposite direction is, is it, it seems, seems somewhat naive. Um, the Europeans messed up uh, financial integration. So do we, you know, if you, if you talk to any businessman and say, do you really believe there's going to be um, an East African currency anytime soon, they'll say, you've got to be joking. It's never going to happen. Um, and, and, and so, so th all the focus is at that end, mm. where actually the focus should be on the issues which, which will make a difference. And that's the private sector. And, and it's the involvement of the private sector and listening to the private sector mm. and giving the private sector a voice and saying to the private sector, tell us what needs to be done. And, and that direction has to come from the politicians to, to the institutions we have, saying to those institutions, make the private sector part of the institution and, and get them involved in, in telling you what really needs to be done. Edwin, I kept cutting you off. No, I was going to very strongly agree with, with, with those statements. I think early on, the, pol you know, the, the conversations must happen at the political level. Uh, so the presidents must agree, this is our common vision. But if they're thinking about the long-term sustainability of this union, which we have seen, you know, came up in the 60s, broke up in the 70s, mm -hmm. there was 20 years lost in between, and now there's a resurgence of the same conversation. The reality is, unless this means something different for the common Wananchi, for the common Kenyan, Tanzanian, Rwandan, that they're seeing improved goods and services, improved opportunities, and so on and so forth, this thing will not last. Mm -hmm. And so the focus must shift from, rightly so, at the macro level, the big infrastructure projects projects must be harmonized at a government to government level. But they, now there needs to be a real focus on how do you actually knit the enterprises and the people together so that the enmity you find between Kenyans and Tanzanians and Rwandans and Burundians, that those, that, 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 that difference is blurred mm. increasingly because that's the only way we'll, this thing will be meaningful in the long term. If we don't do that, a political marriage mm. is far much easier to dissolve than if people actually uh, fully believe that this is a good idea for them. And that will only happen if the experience in, the li in, in life changes mm. because of, uh, of the integration. Let's talk mm. about the elephants in the room. Uh, in particular, let's talk about Tanzania. Let's talk about Burundi as we continue with this conversation around the customs union. Uh, Why is it important to address this? Yeah, uh, let, let me first... Let me draw a picture, but don't count my age because of this. <laughs> uh, in 1950, when, when I joined the businesses, there was no restriction. I can fly anywhere. I can go anywhere. I can, I can buy anything, anytime, anywhere. I want to send my people from here to Uganda. There was no problem. Now, the freedom. And, and then economic used to take part. Should I import from Tanzania to supply to Dar es Salaam, or should I import in Mombasa to supply to Dar es Salaam? Economic would make sense that, no, it cannot. It's easier to get it in Dar es Salaam, easier to import into Dar es Salaam. So practicality, now, the economy is very small, but it had the freedom to do businesses. Today, you can't. Uh, uh, now, what I would like to say that East African Business Council was created to get the private sector support to the East African community. And it was a brilliant idea at that time of Ambassador Musawra. And also, and he approached me because I was the chairman of KM. And it took me three months before I could convince in Ugandans and Tanzanians that let's get together. Mm. And finally, we created East African Business Council. Now, what we want is East African Business Council should be a constituent part of East African community. It cannot be on its own, because at the end of the day, my chairmanship moves every year. It comes to Kenya, it comes to Tanzania, it goes to Uganda, it goes to Rwanda. In five years' time, 
unless the East African community wants to push an agenda to the private sector in a positive way and can go to the president and say, this is what the private sector is saying, mm. then I think there is a chance. So I think that first, let's get an accreditation, not observation, observer mm. status. A status which makes them that we want to use private sector as a tool mm. to improve and, and build the economy. Let's talk about Tanzania and Burundi, if you may. Um, they've often come up as the problematic children in the family when it comes to moving towards some of these ideals that have been set. Your thoughts on that? Uh, you see, recently there was a coalition, meaning Rwanda, Uganda and Kenya getting together to resolve issues. And now, a person like me who operates in all the five countries as a business and other 10 or 12 countries in Africa, total 16 countries. To me, I couldn't understand that why are we as a three now? Once you got in the staff and community, why three are making a different arrangements? But because you don't get any reply, things move on. And even today, we said we are going to be a common custom union. Sometimes in 2014, <laughs> there's no time. And why it could not be a time? I think that there is a I think it's, it's, it's the governments and the will of the, the governments and the political will that, yes, we don't want this to continue, but we want a much larger, a wider market. Mm. So I would think that that's the reasoning that why they were separated out, and now they're feeling and talking. Maybe we'll come back. Mm. But it's, it gives you a little bit of time to think, why are we neglected? Right. Richard, let me bring you into this conversation. Dr. Chandari has touched on some of the political aspects of this conversation. The goal of establishing a political federation by 2015, a few months from now, is one of the targets uh, that have been set. What does this mean for you as a business that has a presence in the region? Is it important for your business? Political federation means absolutely nothing to me. It's, it, I, I see no point. Um, what, what, what I see is the way capital behaves, right? Ca capital, what we need is more capital coming into the region. And, and note, I don't say foreign, foreign capital or mm. local capital. Capital is capital. And capital will go where capital sees an opportunity. Um, if you look at the um, main sources of capital today, what we see are um, pretty much all the global private equity firms and African private equity firms, they're, they're all now raising massive amounts of money. There's huge interest in Africa. Um, they all have... Uh, billion dollar <laughs> funds. If, if you have a billion dollar private equity fund, you have to write a check for each investment of 50 to 100 million dollars. That's, that's the way the market works. Um, if, if we have a regionally integrated East Africa where I can reasonably expect to invest in businesses which are present in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and by the way, Ethiopia, which really is part of this region, should be, um, I'm looking at investing in a company which has access to a market of 250 million people. That's an interesting market. That's an exciting market. And, and my investors will buy the idea that, that I can write a 50 or $100 million check um, into, into buying into that vision. Um, what they can't do is buy into a vision where I've got to do a $5 million investment in Kigali and then a separate $10 million investment in Kenya and a $5 million investment in Uganda. That, that doesn't work. And so, so from, the, from the point of view of capital, regional integration attracts a huge amount of capital. Mm. That, that's what's important to me. And, 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 and con the, the, the making that story a reality is about the nitty gritty things on the grounds. It's, can my truck get across the border? Is my truck gonna get stopped 30 times between Mombasa and Kampala? Um, I'll give you an example in telecommunications. Um, Kenya is incredibly competitive, actually becoming globally competitive in terms of connectivity. We have massive amounts of fiber. We have lots of international cables. Um, Tanzania, which is just right next door, um, houses the East African Parliament in Arusha. Arusha is less than 150 kilometers as the crow flies from Nairobi. In fact, it's much closer to Nairobi than it is to Dar es Salaam. Tanzania, unfortunately, has a policy of a national fiber backbone. Um, so there's a single national fiber backbone, no competition, prices set by government, um, bandwidth in, in Arusha as a result, because I cannot get my cheap bandwidth from Nairobi to Arusha, less than 150 kilometers because of regulation, bandwidth in Arusha is five times the price that it is in Nairobi. 
Um, and, and not only does that make the East African Parliament sitting um, in, in a place where it's expensive, but it then starts grinding the whole regional integration issue to a standstill. So, for example, if I want to expand my business from Kenya across Tanzania into Zambia, guess what? I can't get to Zambia because I can't get across Tanzania. So there's this, like this big red line drawn across mm. East Africa integration because, because of a regulation in one country. What would it take to move the red line? What do you think needs political to be done will. and by whom? It, it, exactly what Dr. Chandraya um, said. W without the political will to say to the institutions, stop this nonsense, get the East African Business Council involved and ask them what they want, mm -hmm. um, that, that's when things will change. Can I, can I just yes. add on the capital piece? Yeah. Um, obviously, as I said earlier, most of the projects we do are, are, tend to be uh, heavy capital intensive projects needing investment and and typically selling to utilities or whatever we need we need the capital to be um, you know invested from outside because the governments don't have the money and we want to have the private sector capability so the ability of building out the stock exchange the fixed income market uh, those capital markets are going to be critical to attract capital. Mm -hmm. From a standpoint of entrepreneurship, which is huge in Kenya, you got a great entrepreneurial culture, a lot of work being done in the ICT uh, area, but there's no way for these businesses to actually grow because the stock exchange is, is really very small mm. and does not have, and it's got 40 or 50 listings, and there's not this, this culture yet of of uh, you know IPOs and things that you see elsewhere around the world that really bring capital into mm. developing small and medium enterprises into bigger bigger uh, capabilities. So I think pooling all of the five countries and again Ethiopia on, on top of that, you have not just 250 million people, but you have then a tremendously much bigger um, potential for a capital base mm. wrapped around you know, as I said, capital markets that will then attract foreign capital in mm. uh, to really invest in and in build out the, uh, the capabilities of the country. And I think that's a very good point. You know, I talked about private equity. You're talking about the listed markets. The, the, think about the listed markets today. So, so and we've been through this we've, many times. We said, right, well, we've got a business in Kenya. Um, okay, we list the business in Kenya. Then we go to Uganda. What do we do in Uganda? Do we do we dual list the Kenyan business on two stock exchanges? Mm. Do we set up another subsidiary and list that subsidiary in Uganda? By the time I've gone through six countries in East Africa, I've got six listed companies. I've now become the most inefficient company in East Africa because my costs have gone through the roof. Yeah. Um, so so there's, it just doesn't make sense, a lot of these things. If one yeah. regional exchange... Fantastic. Suddenly <laughs> growth goes like this. I'm going to come to your comments about this idea of one regional exchange, but a very quick one um, from you, Jay. I heard Richard brushing off the idea of a political federation with big infrastructure projects that oftentimes will involve more than just <clears throat> one country. Would a political federation be important for your business? I would say it's more we need political cooperation. When you do regional projects, if you're trying to do and a pipeline between countries, or if you're trying to do, um, a, you know, power, a power project or uh, anything like that, rail, a rail project, a federation doesn't necessarily, as long as the countries are bilaterally or trilaterally communicating and working together, uh, that's the most important thing. I mean, if you look at the European Union, you know, most of the stuff that we do regionally up in Europe is between countries not necessarily with the EU and mm. Brussels. So I think there's a dynamic there that you can really you know, drive and make sure that you get the right administrations focused uh, around the right things. Uh, let me add another point which is very interesting. You know, there are many, many institutions who are trying to help regional cooperation. African Development Bank is a classical example which really looks at the regional, mm. not as individual country. Mm. But we do not have the same policies from World Bank. The World Bank representative in Kenya would be thinking differently. His agenda would be different. In Tanzania, the agenda will be different. In Uganda, the agenda will be different. Why can't we just make it that they must, the first, the, the, before the man comes to here, he must understand that he has first a responsibility to support the regional, because that is where the, the policies and pressure could come from. Mm. But otherwise, it's individually 
Yeah. Fragmented. Yeah. Let me come back to you around your comments around financial integration. Mm. I, I was going to characterize and say part of what you're hearing from the panel is actually a very healthy impatience to getting things done. Right? So I don't think anybody's saying, let's walk away from regional integration. So case in point, we, uh, we do a fair amount of work with financial services. And uh, my trip to Tanzania was actually supporting one of our clients that's a bank. Uh, I think there was a study that came out two years ago that said Kenya is actually a major provider of investment capital uh, into the rest of the region. Now, most of that has been in the form of uh, local Kenyan banks opening operations in, you know, across the region. And you look at the numbers on the, on the banking sector, and they're very striking, right? So in Kenya, year-on-year -year growth over the last five years has been in, of, of profit before tax, has been on the, uh, on the orders of about 36 to 40%, um, right? So every year at a macro level in the banking industry. You go to Uganda and you go to Tanzania. Tanzania, once you adjust from Tanzania shillings uh, to either US dollar or Kenya shillings, what, was, what previously looks like as 18, 17, 18% growth drops down to something in the single digits. Mm. But in all the conversations I've had with my clients, none of them are saying it's time to shut down those operations. Yet, by definition, every single dollar they're putting in those markets is a dollar that could be making more money if they were investing it in the Kenyan operations. And so because of that, you're seeing a very healthy impatience and saying, we need to get this thing going because we see the potential it can have mm. in, you know, from a business enterprise side, uh, as well as in improving the goods and services that are delivered to the various citizens. And so it's, we're just held back by the politics, which at a macro level, people say the right things. Mm. But the minute people get to nationalistic and think of the nation state as defining you know, this geography that, that we are in charge of, that competition, rather than being healthy competition in a positive sense, actually starts being a clash. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you end up, you know, from a regional integration point, you end up getting to what's the lowest common denominator. Who's, whoever is the slowest is as fast as the whole will move. And I think there needs to be a sense of consequences to those who are not moving fast enough. Uh, and, and, and unleash essentially the potential for the others. And that's part of what we've seen in this coalition of the willing, where people said, three of us are willing to go forward, you guys will catch up when you catch up. And we've seen that really begin to energize the conversations and the speed with which a lot of these macro infrastructure programs are being talked about. Now we need to take that to the sector level in uh, regulation that says, Richard, you can lay cable wherever you want in the region mm. and serve whoever, you, you know, whoever makes sense for you as a business. It means as a pharma company, another client of ours uh, who struggles with, you know, the East African market is attractive to them, but if you tell them they have to spend time and effort in registering the same product in Kenya, in Tanzania, mm. in Burundi, in Rwanda, it stops making sense. So on that point of uh, consequences for those who move the slowest and a healthy impatience that is emanating from the conversations that we're having here today, we're going to take a short break. But when we come back, we pick up the discussion with a particular focus on ICT, on people, as we look at regional integration in East Africa. Don't go away. Welcome back to the CNBC Africa World Economic Forum debate. Well, before the break, we touched on the point of ICT. We're going to bring it right back there. And Richard, let's get your comments on how we can leverage uh, the gains that have been made in connectivity and ICT, and in particular, mobile technology to drive regional integration. Yeah. You know, I think we're going from the um, uh, uh, last decade, decade and a half of building infrastructure to the next decade, which is going to be about the content um, uh, across the entire ICT spectrum. So we've, we've built a lot of fiber infrastructure. There's actually a lot more fiber in East Africa than people realize. And, and, and that's continuing to happen. There's continuous investment. But the real growth is going to come out of content. And content largely will be about government um, taking services to citizens online, because, because that will achieve a number of things um, in terms of um, government, it will uh, improve quality of services, it will reduce cost of delivering services, it will also get rid of all the rent seeking around um, mm. delivery of government services. But for the private sector, it will create a, a, a customer who wants to consume large amounts of ICT, because mm. taking our um, ICT companies from where they are today to, to becoming um, big sustainable companies as a driver of the economy means they need the business and the biggest mm. supplier of that business is, is going to be government. And so as we see those projects coming on stream, um, that's going to be incredibly helpful. But, but, but unless the regional integration is there, 
um, it's, it's going to hold us back a little bit. So if every country starts insisting, you know, it has to be our company that does our ICT, then we're going to be back to the same problem again. Um, I, I would echo something that was said before the break about um, the, 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 we, we may be sounding rather negative as a panel. Regional integration is happening for sure, and it's happening, um, it's happening despite policy, not because of policy. It's right. the private sector that's making regional integration happen. It could just happen so much faster and so much bigger if it was given a little bit of help um, from, from policy. Jay, your thoughts around ICT infrastructure, sure. and in particular, if you can also touch on whether what has been achieved in regional integration has translated to the people of the region. Well, I, I think in, in, our, in our area, one of the, the key things for ICT infrastructure um, is going to be health care. And that is the, the ability to deliver health care services out to uh, rural areas and places where uh, you don't really have the, the infrastructure. And I'm not talking about physical infrastructure, but also the software. Yeah. And the software in healthcare is doctors and nurses and trained people. And that is really the bottleneck of delivering a, a wide array of, of services into uh, the region. And I think, you know, the ICT infrastructure allows with equipment that we have, you know, we can do ultrasounds, uh, we can do uh, x-rays out with, let's say, um, uh, clinicians, and then get them back here in an urban area in Nairobi uh, for, you know, re read, uh, to be read by radiologists. And that, those are the kind of things you can, rather than having to have a radiologist out Everywhere. in the area. So I think there's a tremendous potential in healthcare around that. So you think about regionally, as, as Richard said, Arusha is closer to Nairobi than it is to Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. So are you better off on a healthcare standpoint with a patient that has to go somewhere going across the border to Kenya or, or staying in Tanzania or, you know, and same thing in other, other areas, Kisumu, Kampala, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the kind of things that we've got we've to think about and how we structure because, again, in a healthcare area, you have the urban areas that fundamentally have the majority of the trained capabilities of specialists and doctors and nurses and the ability to have them spread out, if you will, into mm -hmm. the rural areas because that's the way that you can, you can combat the maternal and, and newborn mortality uh, rates that are still too high here. Uh, and so I think there's a real, a real potential around that. That's, so that's one area that I see ICT making a big impact. Edwin, back to you. I, I would say I think technology has the great potential of helping us leapfrog across almost every single sector that there is. Uh, we've seen that happen in communications. We've seen that happen in the financial services industry. And almost by definition, people on the continent and in the region live off the grid, right? So, you know, something as basic as power. We did a, we, we looked at this uh, at the power question um, and asked how many people, you know, if you take Africa-wide, the most aggressive rural electrification programs, and, and asked what's that rate of, of electrification, and then we looked at what's the population growth, uh, and we did this across the globe. Africa is actually the only place that the number of people who on a daily basis uh, grows and are off the grid actually increases. Right? So every other place, the rural electrification programs are much faster than population growth. Mm -hmm. In Africa, there's a 1% or 2% differential, which means increasingly the solution to getting power to people uh, and getting communications to people and getting water and sanitation to people is not only the large infrastructure projects. We actually need to think about decentralized uh, ability to deliver services to mm -hmm. those individuals at a home level. And so the developed world, you see this happening in everybody having a solar panel on, on their rooftops. Increasingly, that, has, that, that will be a major part of the way we solve and bring people uh, into, into a connected world. Uh, and so technology and, and, and ability to communicate will be a critical part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that extends beyond. So power, water, mm -hmm. sanitation, and all these basic things that, uh, that, that, we take, that people take for granted in the developed world, the only solution will be a very decentralized service. I think, I think one of the things that we keep forgetting being here is how the M-Pesa system here in Kenya is unbelievable from a standpoint of how yeah. commerce gets done. Exactly. And I mean, I think, I think the number was 1.9 trillion shillings last year that was transferred. 25% of GDP. Yeah, 25% of GDP. That's incredible amount. On incredible electric, uh, electronic monetary uh, transactions. In the U.S., you're talking about 0 0.001 of GDP that gets done that way. When I got here, everybody said that Kenya is an unbanked community, a country. Mm. And it is when you consider 
the way t typical people think about banking, exactly. which is you got to have an account, a checking account, a credit card. Yeah. Well, here, you know, you've got however many people, 20, 30 million people with cell phones that that's their bank account. Yeah. It's a wholly different way of thinking. Yeah. And, it, and the flexibility it provides in the economy is, mm. is pretty tremendous. What we've seen in PESIT become the poster child uh, for mobile technology, but we've also seen it not taking off in countries like Tanzania. Mm. So how do we replicate this model? Maybe, mm. Doctor, let's get you, uh, how do we, we make Tanzania have a success story of MPESA? Okay, uh, <laughs> let me, uh, because we operate in 16 African countries, and uh, we find this all the time. Why a country, uh, let, let me give you a definition. F there are 54 countries in, the com in, in, in Africa. There are four languages. And the word sovereign status. Now sovereign status, everybody would like to have it because they are independent states. They can make their own policies. But sovereign state also gives you a responsibility that you've got to look after your people, that they get enough to eat, that they have enough to work. That responsibility part and sovereign status is forgotten. Many a times, because I'm sovereign status, I would do exactly what I think. But that is not what, we, what the end result should be. Mm. The end result should be, are your people becoming more poorer or they become more richer? Mm. That is the whole fundamental. Now, can we say that the 50 years of independence in throughout Africa, some of the countries a little later, but most have been around 40 to 50 years, have we lifted our people, the GDP of our people, the living standard of our people? If you have not been able to do it, then that responsibility is still wasted in us. Mm. So I think that when we talk about why we cannot get it done in a particular state, and why we can get it in a particular state. It depends upon the government's ability mm. and the private sector. The drivers are always a private sector in between. People then participate with the mm. private sector to get things done. But if you're not there... I I'm going to pose a quick question to you. We've got about five minutes left, and I want us to talk about the expansion of the East African community. I mean, we've, the discussions have been going on for some years now, mm -hmm. and in particular looking at uh, the South Sudan question as well as the DRC question. What would it mean bringing them into the fold? Mm. So let me answer the MPESA question because it's an interesting one. Uh, the quick answer is, in my hypothesis, it will get there. It just takes time. So Tanzania now has about 25 million people on a, with a mobile account, of which about 9 million are active. Right. So in terms of scale and penetration, it's getting there. The big difference is in Kenya, Safaricom just had such a dominant brand and dominant balance sheet that they could invest extensively in building an agent network that none of the telcos have a similar dominance in Tanzania. It will get there because as a matter of necessity, it's, it's filling a certain, a certain question, just a matter of time. Uh, to your question on, on the expansion of the East African community, I think some of these conversations have been ongoing for a while. So DRC is one, South Sudan is one, Ethiopia is one. Uh, South Sudan probably is off the map now, just given uh, what, what's going on there. I think it's good to bring in more people because it expands the market. But let's do that by making sure that that doesn't become the lowest common denominator that holds every, everybody else's back. Because there's always that challenge of every time you bring in a new member, you have to negotiate every single part. Rather than starting from zero, let's make sure if new members are coming in, they're starting from where everybody is and therefore able to grow. Do you agree there. that should be the criteria before yeah, new yeah, members should come absolutely. in? Absolutely. Otherwise, you know, the, you know, it's a drag. You are moving this way and there are two pulling you back. You cannot do any expansion, you cannot move forward if there is a pull. The, the idea is to move fast. Now, if you want to move fast, and the guy who now says, but I'm very new, I don't understand it, then he's not a party. Richard, what do you need? Do you need uh, more players uh, in, in the pool, or do you need a fewer players that are moving fast? Uh, uh. <laughs> Um, competition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a slight conflict there. Um, w what we see is that, that, that ICT consumption is going to be driven by um, healthcare, 
all government services, so healthcare, education, um, everything around um, service delivery, doing it electronically and leveraging off electronic payment mechanisms. By the way, um, whilst mobile money is the poster child, card-based money is, is growing nearly as fast as mobile money today. Um, and that's not credit cards, that's debit cards. Yeah. Because of the explosion of bank accounts, um, people like Equity Bank, um, banking a lot of people, that, that's growing nearly as fast. And so you have this whole ecosystem of, of mobile money, um, card money, bank accounts, and, and it's all become integrated. Now that needs to be integrated into delivery of services. As people use more services, that's, that's where there's this huge growth going to come from in the ICT industry. Um, and, and we see that happening in the next 10 years. So I'm going to come back. Do you want more players or do you want fewer players moving <laughs> fast? <laughs> Um, I, I, in, in ICT spe specifically, if, if you look at um, the experience in other countries, India for example, um, a lot of their um, success has come out of developing some national champions, some, 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 actually some larger companies which become national champions and, and, and they then have the scale and economies of scale to, to really um, institutionalize local capacity. So I, I think bigger is good. That's not to say entrepreneurial startups aren't good, but, but, but we need more national champions. Bigger. That's all I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop on to. Very final comment from you, Jay, before we open up to the audience. We spoke about tourism in the beginning. I picked up an interesting article yesterday saying that from a Tanzanian point of view, there is a concern that having a regional tourist visa would undermine brand Tanzania and what Tanzania itself brings to the table. What do you make of that thinking? As a tourist, Are you asking me as a tourist? As a tourist? Uh, Let's uh, ask you as a tourist. Who builds infrastructure? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think you can, the branding within anything is, is up to each country or each entity, let's say. And so the ability for the Tanzania brand or the Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, whatever brand under an umbrella, I think works, works just fine. I mean, you know, the U.S., every, if you go in the U.S., I guarantee you that if you watch the television, you're going to see a commercial for some other state than the state you're in to try to get people to come. Now, foreign visitors, will, they're not visiting the United States. They're visiting states that have somehow reached out mm. and got, you know, their brand recognized by the tourism, tourists. So I think that's, I think it's, and then if you have that umbrella to reach out to a broader audience, in, your, in the West to attract people here, and then to some of the earlier comments about making it easier to get around, I think you'll have a tremendous tourism brand uh, for East Africa, which consists of all of these countries, because they each have a different, mm. different uh, thing that they offer. You know what you just raised is symptomatic of the problem, that, that um, nobody advertises and markets a visa, right? Yeah. It, having an East Africa visa doesn't undermine the Tanzania brand. It's sort of a nonsense. It's this whole nonsense that goes on between <laughs> Kenya right. and Tanzania. Right. Well, on that final nonsense point, I'm going to open up the floor uh, and get some question and answers, uh, questions from the audience posed uh, to our panelists. Please uh, do stand up when you uh, ask your question and please indicate to which panelists you'd like to direct your question to. We're going to take uh, a few rounds, uh, three uh, questions at a time. So let's have a uh, the gentleman in the third row, the gentleman in the third row on the other side, and we have a third question to go, and uh, just behind, right. Let's start off with you, sir. I'm Steve Olson, it's a regional advisory leader with uh, Anthony Young EY. Thank you very much, a fascinating debate. I just want to probe what you've been talking about in terms of political will a little bit, on the basis that ultimately politicians look towards their one inchy or to their leaders uh, in, or the citizens as to what they're doing. <laughs> So two questions, really. One, has the size of the prize, particularly for Kenyans, Tanzanians, Ethiopians, etc., properly been expressed, both in the public sector and the private sector? And also, when we think about regions, are there any good regional examples? Um, uh, you know, I'm thinking of Europe, perhaps, good or indifferent. Um, I'm thinking of Southeast Asia that you'd look to and say, well, there's an example um, that, that we, we might want to adopt, not slavishly, but uh, um, with an East African mindset. To whom would you like to direct your question? I think probably to each panel member, really. Okay, we'll divide them accordingly. Let's take a, a question from the gentleman over there. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nader Shams. I'm from Dahlberg Global Development Advisors. Uh, my question is for the entire panel, whoever would like to uh, answer. 
Uh, it's two parts. The first part is the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index ranks the average East African community member state uh, at around 115. That was in 2011. Uh, do you feel it's a fair expectation for the EAC to realize its full potential uh, when its member states find ease of doing business within their own borders so difficult? And the second question is actually tied to the, uh, the previous uh, speaker. Uh, which is looking at examples around the world, we see successful unions like NAFTA, um, SADC, the South African Customs Union, that have a strong, uh, one strong economic powerhouse. It's, it's almost unipolar. Then we see the EU, uh, we see ASEAN, maybe as other examples, which are more relatively multipolar. Uh, when you're looking at these other regional bureaus and looking to the future, how do you see the East African community also playing out? Do you feel that it needs to have one strong regional powerhouse? In this case, currently, it, it, Kenya looks to be a prime example. Um, or do you feel that it will need to be more multipolar? Thank you. Let's take the question just behind you. Uh, my name is Jason Lakin from the International Budget Partnership, and uh, unfortunately, my question is also for everyone. Um, I wanted to also unpack the issue of political will a bit more, and just to understand from a policy perspective, when we talk about political will, it, do it doesn't help us that much if we're thinking, okay, well, we're just waiting for some new leaders to come who will have more political will. So can we talk a little bit more about what are the interests that define that political will? Why are we not seeing the political will? And where are there, are there interests, because we're sort of, you've painted it as well, the private sector supports integration, and then we have this political will obstacle. But are there also private interests or other interests that we're not talking about that are preventing us from moving forward this agenda? And, and linked to the issue, the, the issue that Richard raised, on the flip side of that, are there what are the issues that are actually driving the discussions around around currency integration? For example, if it's true that, as Richard says, that currency integration is the, the least important of these issues, why are we spending so much time talking about that, which is so unrealistic, and so little time talking about the nitty-gritty issues that actually affect businesses in the region? Can I make an appeal that uh, each of the panel members perhaps address one of the questions? Otherwise, we'll still be here until this <laughs> afternoon. Um, Jay, would you like to pick a First question? pick? Wow. <laughs> you, you, you get to pick the easy one. Although there were supposed to be three, and there were like six or seven in there. But, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, um, other regional um, groups. I think you know, when, you, when you look, and, and they're all different from a standpoint of success, uh, but you have to you have to look at you have to look at Europe as one of the big, bigger success factors of what they've done. They are a, a huge trading block now. Um, you can you know the currency issues that, that occurred over the last few years. Um, you know it, it was a piece of accountability in how they in each country, et cetera. But over time, again, you have to look at this over a long period of time. The EU bloc is a huge trading bloc, and it has it has made it a lot easier for a lot of those countries, especially the the old East Europe countries, to come in and really thrive under that and and take advantage of that. So I think that's been been one. NAFTA uh, for the North America free trade was another one that that really boosted trade between the regions and things. And I think you know one of the things that will help East Af the African regional ones, all of all of them, is you b building the infrastructure, because it's it's great to talk about all the stuff, but if you don't have ease of access around the countries, it's going to be very difficult moving goods, et cetera. It's not just a question of getting them stuck at customs, which is one, but it, you know it can't take how long it takes to get from Mombasa to Kampala on a truck. And that's even if they don't stop. It still takes too long because of the infrastructure, et cetera. So those are the kind of things that I think have got to also be developed. You also have to take a look at, again, from an infrastructure standpoint, are there better places for governments to put their money to, br to bring up their infrastructure? Is it better for, you know, Ethiopia's got the huge potential with hydro on the uh, Grand Renaissance Dam. Can they provide power to... Rwanda, which really doesn't have any fuel other than stuff that comes with methane that comes out of Lake Kivu, is that easier than them trying to build their own power plants? I mean, those are the kind of things that 
that I think governments can focus around on and help each other's infrastructure. So, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's really what we've seen mm -hmm. in Europe and, and a few of these other areas. Since you've decided on the easier of the lot, let's also get you to comment on the unipolar versus a multipolar um, setup. You're always going to have a strong player. It do, it, it's impossible not to. And all of the and you see you see what's happened over time. There is, you know, and then the strong have to make sure that they also okay. put the smaller ones in and let okay. them share some of the. They're not. It's not all the big co countries putting everything into the small countries. You've yeah. got to have it both ways. And I think you know you've seen that. In, uh, and, and if you look at, at the EU, you know Germany, from a standpoint of of um, the the monetary union, they have benefited tremendously mm -hmm. because their exchange rate, the exchange rate of the euro, of the euro, has been kept lower because of the other countries. Mm -hmm. And if Germany was still doing the Deutschmark, their their exchange rate would have been so much higher; they would have been uncompetitive. So they their their trade that occurred from that was unbelievable through this time period. And then, and then subsequently, the other countries benefited as well because they had a currency as, that they, a stronger currency than they would have had alone. Mm -hmm. So I mean, those are the kind of things. Not to get in the currency debate for East right. Africa, <laughs> but I mean, from a trade standpoint, it's really important. Richard, uh, your pick, or you know, I, I'm I'm never a great fan of this whole benchmarking thing. Um, if we had benchmarked our telecoms industry, we wouldn't have mobile phones. If we'd benchmarked our financial services industry, we wouldn't have M-Pesa. Um, you know, being an entrepreneur, I believe we should create our own um, dynamic. And we, and we are different from other parts of the world. We're 53 relatively small countries with relatively small economies. We need to come up with our, with our own solutions. Um, within the East African context, I think... Um, you know, there was a question about the private sector, and you know, of course, the private sector is, for all the good things we say about the private sector, that, that, that there are some particular incentives and dynamics of the private sector. We don't have, we're not accountable to an electorate. We don't have to have elections. We're accountable for profits. Mm. Um, and, and frankly, um, when, once you get down to the, I'm the CEO of a company, what I need to do is maximize my profits, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to maximize those profits. And, and if my profits, I've, if I think my profits are going to be maximized by having a closed country, I'm going to lobby to close it. Mm -hmm. if, I th if, I'm, if I'm now a bigger company and my profits are going to maximize by opening, I'm going to lobby to open it. Um, and so, and so there's, there's a complication there that everybody has a different agenda, and you're never going to harmonize those agendas. And, and I think what, what is really important is, is what Dr. Chandaria brought up, is that we, as a private sector, we recognize a lot of our faults. Over a period of time, the private sector has got together and created the Private Sector Alliance, and they've become um, part of, uh, the, then, then we created the East Africa Business Council. And, and so you do have some degree of the private sector sort of, sort of agreeing on what the priorities are and what needs to be done and, 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 and creating a consensus. Now what needs to happen is that East Africa Business Council needs to get formally recognized by the East African community so that, so that by being formally recognized and, and formally getting engaged, um, then, 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 then it's not just asking for the private sector's opinion when they want it, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's being an integral part of the East African community. And, it. and, and this it. is what Dr. Chandari has been pushing for, and, and, and maybe you want to say some more about that, because I think it's, a, it's, it's really important. Doctor, I'm going to come back to you with the questions around political will and the role of the private sector in driving that as well. But Edwin, let's get your comments on the currency integration question, mm. which is outstanding on our list. I, 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 two comments. Uh, on the currency question, I think what you're hearing loud and clear from the panel is a lot of political effort is being spent on that question. Most people here don't think it's important. Right? It's not the important thing. Uh, if you had, because you have a finite amount of political will and political capital to be spent, it's much better if that is being spent on fixing and harmonizing the practical things, the regulation, the infrastructure, rather than talking about a big question of political integration and currency integration that, frankly, even at an individual level, most people in East Africa might not support. And so the headwinds you have to fly against to make that real are so great, yet we haven't even extracted the basic value of the integration by just getting our policies to be consistent mm -hmm. and, to, and, and to work. Uh, for the goods and services that, that you know, and, and, and businesses and individuals. So I think that's, that's very much the message that you're hearing from the panel. The, the second thing I'd say is to Richard's point, 
a lot of enterprises are now beginning to ask, even though they continue expanding and looking at East Africa as the first port of entry if companies are trying to enter from Tanzania to Kenya or Tanzania to Uganda or Kenya to Rwanda and so on and so forth, people naturally start there. But we're seeing an interesting move in a lot of our clients who are saying, Actually, Nigeria is a far much bigger market, um, and Nigerians and us get along and don't have to deal with baggage of being Kenyan. I'll go to Nigeria. And so if we don't fix things in the East African community, people, businesses will <clears throat> pursue those opportunities in more far-flung locations, which will essentially, because there's a finite amount of resources, energy, capital, that that capital will flow there mm -hmm. rather than actually strengthening the, the union as could be. And so I think there's, there's, there's a bit of an urgency to fixing these things. And there's a big plea to anybody who sits in these rooms to say, let's spend our political energy and our political capital fixing the practical things about the union rather than talking about political federation. It will take too much effort mm. to get there, and it's not worth it in the immediate term. We unfortunately have run out of time. So we're going to take 30 second final closing statements from each of the panelists. The key takeaway <laughs> that you'd like the audience to walk away with. Let's start off with you, Jay. Um, I think the key thing is it, there's a tremendous opportunity. We talked about all the impediments and things like that, but as someone said earlier, it's a, it's, it's a uh, we need to continue to drive this because there's too much opportunity not to make this happen. And I think it's going to get there, and it's just a co combination of the private sector as well as working with governments and really pushing through what needs to happen. And then I think it ends up snowballing because then you start to see the growth and growth begets growth. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, Africa and very optimistic about East, East Africa. It's one of the reasons we put our headquarters here for all of Africa. And, and I think, uh, you know, continued discussions and, and pushing this forward is going to be really be the key. Richard, your 30 seconds. Yeah, um, East Africa is the land of opportunity. Um, my, my, my one sort of takeaway um, is if the political leaders would put the same energy and political capital and time into creating an East Africa capital market um, as they put into trying to create an East Africa currency, stop the currency, start working on the capital markets, they would achieve a hundred times more. Uh, I, I think I believe in East Africa, East African community. I am always, why I'm critical about it? Because I feel we're losing time. This has been going on since 57. Then we dropped again. Then we started again. We, we don't have to be taught the tricks of the trade. If we know it, then why don't we fix it? All it will end up is that the local, the individual Kenyan, Ugandan, Tanzanian, Rwandan, or Burundian will be much more happier because they will get their goods, their services much cheaper. Right now what we are doing is underwriting everything to somebody else, and our children are sitting on, uh, facing the streets. This cannot go on. And East African community, as a total body, if I disagree, but three of you or four of you disagree, he has no way to go. He has to pull himself in. Mm -hmm. He might be upset about it for a while, <laughs> but then, you know, three, three of us are going to pull him up. This is the only way you can make, because this doesn't work all the time. But mm -hmm. the marriage, if I do, then I have a responsibility. And the responsibility is to, the, to my family, to my, my people. And if I forget that, and these institutions will compel you to make it happen. Final thoughts from me would be, somebody told me this um, a while back, I think it was in 1976, uh, the Europeans actually sent a delegation to the East African community to learn about regional integration. Right? So in some ways, we were way ahead of everybody else then. And they learn from us now. There's some things they did different that you know they've ended up where they are. Yeah. But we were ahead uh, of the world in a lot of ways. And so there's a lot of catching up to be done. We need to spend our political capital on the things that actually make a difference. The institutions we've built have been largely political. Uh, so the East African community, the East African parliament. That has gotten us as far as we can. We now need to do, move this to an enterprise and citizens level and spend our political capital and effort in making that happen. And then we'll get to political federation and, and single currencies down the line. Mm -hmm. But if we don't achieve this middle part, we will end up exactly where we were in 1977. 
Thank you so much for joining us. We've had robust and honest conversations identifying the bottlenecks that have taken away from the pace of regional integration in the region, as well as speaking about the opportunities or the low-hanging fruit that can catapult East Africa to being the true poster child for integration on the continent. Thank you again to my guests. That's uh, Jay Island, General Electric's President and CEO for Africa, Richard Bell, the non-executive vice chairman for the Wananchi Group, and Dr. Manu Chandaria, an industrialist across East and Central Africa, and of course the founding chairman of the East African Business Council, and Edwin Macharia, Dalberg partner who has joined this conversation. Until next time, it's goodbye for now. Thank you.